and we will have a five minute q a in the end of the talk and the talk is about nightmares in the automotive uh, security <laughs> and we have uh, Thomas Sempini here who is a, a pen, pen tester with automotive um, and he will talk about the nightmares. He welcome. Thank you. So hello everyone, I hope you're not drunk or sleepy, I'm sleepy, but uh, we will go through it. Um, so today we will talk about horror stories in the automotive industry. I'm Thomas Rampinis, otherwise you might know me as Crow Tom. This is the CCC edition. Uh, it's been already once uh, presented. Uh, I'm Thomas Rampinis, as I said. I'm automotive pentest lead by day uh, in Auxilium Cybersecurity, and thanks a lot to this team for the support and the help for this research, and the security researcher by night. Uh, I like to hack everything everywhere. I don't really care. I just like to hack everything I get, uh, gets into my hands, and I really love security conferences. For more, you can go to my website. There are some specific goals for this talk. Uh, first of all, I want to analyze the state of cybersecurity in the automotive industry. I want to present some unique and hopefully interesting for you use cases, result of around 100 pen tests and research projects in this industry. Uh, endorse and push more hackers uh, to the automotive industry and educate uh, the new, the old and the bold of this uh, industry. And of course, raise and highlight the significance of security-related devices. Uh, let's start with an overview of the state of cybersecurity in the automotive industry and discuss where we currently are, what is planned, and where we're currently heading. And there are several incidents throughout the years, uh, but I still get fascinated by the quality uh, of the findings that get discovered on the automotive industry into 2023, still. Uh, some examples from the last years are some fixed uh, code vulnerabilities in Nissan, for example, which is one of many examples of this vulnerability in the wild. Still in Kias with just USB cables, I mean, okay. Uh, key for vulnerabilities again and again. Um, remote unlocks of whole vehicle fleets due to flaws in Sirius XM. Um, unlocking and stealing vehicles due to easily accessible CAM buses and really bad internal architecture, something that we will also talk in this, uh, speak about in this talk. And that's only a sample uh, out of a huge list of similar in incidents in this sector. I don't know if there is a light in the end of the tunnel, but the automotive industry cannot con be considered new. Uh, the connecti connectivity and technolo uh, technological aspect of it, though, is not so old. Uh, entertainment and constant need for connectivity are m the main reasons for the technological advancements and integration in this uh, industry. And usually we are talking about 100 plus year old industries uh, trying to catch up with some young startups. And this is an example for you to understand what is the current state of cybersecurity. This is the BMW i7. And outside of the common things that you usually see in a vehicle, you see my whole living room. Basically, all these things are interconnected. All these services are connected to the internet and exposed to some interfaces that are ap approachable by attackers eventually. Uh, in order to fight this, uh, there are some regulations that uh, get introduced. I don't want to bore you. It's really late. I don't want you to sleep. Uh, basically, to go through it really fast, it provides a set of standards uh, that must be met in order to ensure the safety of road vehicles. Uh, it requires operation of certified cyber security management systems. And in any case, in summary, it tries to, sep, uh, to save the completely unregulated mess that exists until, na until now. And the big caveat is that penetration testing is solely based on the risk assessment of the target vehicle or the target ECU. Uh, going into the first part, uh, I want to have a discussion about the Tier 1 suppliers, which of course play a huge role in the automotive industry, uh, with cars, cars being literally like Legos, pieces of Legos that you construct from different Tier 1 suppliers in order to build the whole vehicle. Uh, to start 
talking about it. Uh, we need to talk about cybersecurity requirements, which are developed and distributed by OEMs. And it's usually the engineering requirements uh, for cybersecurity risk management. And the tier one suppliers should ideally comply to those for correct and secure functionality of the supplied components. Um, if those requirements are followed, though, is a different discussion. So let's go through some real life examples that lead to complete compromise of a vehicle in the most dumb way possible. And the reason for this, uh, from my perspective, is that several tier ones are based in countries with low transparency and weak governance, if you know what I mean. Uh, and secondly, we don't know how clear are these cybersecurity requirements in order to be followed by these tier one suppliers. And then if uh, not only the, uh, no, the OEM, but also the Pentes suppliers usually have a reactive approach uh, to security testing, which assumes that everything described on those requirements is followed, which leads to shaping weak penetration testing methodology uh, and test cases with high probability of losing important parts of the attack surface. Um, to start with our uh, first use case and the path to game over, we need to understand a bit what is UDS. Uh, basically, it's one of the application layer protocols that run on these electronic control units, the computers inside the vehicle, for communication between them uh, in automotive electronics. Uh, it allows uh, diagnostic function, uh, functionality such as reading and erasing fault codes, programming and reprogramming ECUs, testing and monitoring of them. It consists of several services uh, which can be used to perform specific actions. And the really common authentication schema is uh, in UDS is the security access service or uh, 0x27, which allows elevated access to unauthenticated, to authenticated users. And talking about this service, we need to understand how it works in order to go on how we eventually uh, bypass it. Uh, and basically, sorry, basically there is a client which is us as a tester or some reprogramming uh, tool and the ECU. The client that wants to be authenticated into the ECU sends a seed request to the ECU. The, the ECU generates a random seed and calculates the key by using a random, um, like uh, an algorithm uh, for this calculation and the secret key. It sends the random seed uh, to the client and the client using the same algorithm, the same secret key, has to calculate the calculated key where the ECU verifies it and grants access to the client if they are matching from both calculations on each side. Uh, regarding this service and considering the, tre the trend uh, of loosely developed requirements, we have observed several types of outcomes, including sloppy authentication implementations, uh, weak sources of randomness, something that I talked last year in Troopers uh, conference and my talk UDS fuzzing in the path to game over, and backdoors implemented outside of the scope of the cybersecurity requirements. As an example, we have an extra uh, security access subservice, which is ex with extremely weak security for some reason. And actually, that's the case here. Here we have a real life example uh, on the screenshot on the right, and the same process as we saw uh, previously. So we send a seed request uh, to the ECU. We are the client, we send the seed request to the ECU. We receive uh, a random seed, despite being four bytes. Uh, it's debatable on if we can crack it and how long. If, the, if there is a proper implementation, there should be a new uh, randomly generated seed every time. In this case, this seed is always the same. Every time we request it, we have the same seed. And by testing the first, uh, the first key that we send, which is only zeros, we managed to get a positive response. The positive response here is the 6773, uh, and the ECU grants access to us. And this eventually is a backdoor from our perspective. Of course, there is no security in this case. And while the tier one supplier um, supplied the components might follow the OEM cybersecurity requirement, that doesn't mean that we only need to test by the book. As you saw, 
by enumerating and finding an extra security access subservice, we found out that we can bypass it easily without any uh, calculation, any secret algorithm or any secret key, and we can get direct access to it by only supplying zero, zeros. Uh, in most cases, several misconfigurations exist outside of the cybersecurity requirements. The OEM doesn't know or doesn't want us to know, uh, so they don't communicate it. And the tier ones did, uh, or the tier ones did not inform the OEM in the end, which is the backdoor use case that we had now. Why? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, the solution, from my perspective, from our perspective, uh, for the OEM is to build uh, more strict cybersecurity requirements. For the pencil suppliers like us and the researchers, is to build a more robust methodology, which, which will cover a realistic amount of test cases. Uh, don't build it solely based on the requirements. Stop thinking only about requirements. Build it on the experience and the attack surface that you have uh, in front of you. And of course, educate the client, OEM, Tier 1, or anyone else. Education is the biggest part here. We need the client to understand what, is, uh, what we found and what can be the severity and the impact of it. Uh, moving forward, uh, everything will be changed in the end, but moving forward now, uh, we need to talk about the main bridge of connectivity of a vehicle to the real world uh, lately, which is the telematics unit, and how many vehicles get connected in the network, uh, in the network that uh, eventually they should not actually be. Um, first of all, almost no vehicles uh, uh, ship anymore without a telematics unit. Um, it ma main purpose of a telematics unit is a secure update procedures, uh, which became a necessity. They are part of uh, the, recent, the recent regulations also. Uh, there are several running services, including a remote vehicle management in most cases. Uh, you can unlock doors, you can uh, start vehicle conditioning, and many other uh, use cases that a user might need, might not, I don't know. And the TLDR is that please consider the applicable connectivity while designing the architecture. So now that we got a uh, first taste of how things are getting connected, let's dive into a real-world scenario of a supercar manufacturer this, in this case that pushed the connectivity of their pre-production vehicle. Uh, in order to perform secure updates, a remote man management of the fleet for personalized support uh, of their clients. In this case, and as a first part, we have a telematics unit, an ECU handling the cellular connectivity and the connection to the internet. And this telematics unit is connected to the main head unit uh, over some kind of interface. It can be an RS-485, serial, Broadreach, which is automotive Ethernet, or anything else that is applicable in automotive. Uh, at this point, one ECU is already connected, and considering that this kind of ECUs usually come with several publicly available services, in many cases including SSH, uh, you can understand that this kind of, uh, of a risk is not implemented properly. But there are proper implementations uh, limiting the exposure at the minimum using hypervisors, for example, on the head unit to isolate the exposed system from the rest of the ECUs and the connectivity in the vehicle and gateways that filter all requests coming from the exposed unit. But um, I don't know if this is the reality, uh, because what we can see in the complete hypothetical, in this case, architecture of this vehicle, uh, because we are under NDA, of course, uh, the different domains uh, of, of this architecture um, are interconnected between them. But the biggest problem here uh, is that there are several components directly connected to the head unit, as we can see. Uh, on the red lines, red lines, instead of passing through the gateway for proper routing and filtering uh, of the target messages. Is that really an issue? Interconnected buses can act as a stepping stone in safety critical attacks, and gateways are commonly used for message filtering and routing, as we said. By passing the gateway, as we saw in the previous architecture, results in direct interception and communication 
of uh, CAN messages. And at this point, the target ECUs existing on those buses can be analyzed, enumerated, and explode, uh, exploited without the assumed restrictions from the protections that we mentioned. And getting deeper into our attack scenario, let's remember the UDS, and this time we will use the service 11, which is uh, ECU reset, which does exactly what the name implies. Uh, resets the target ECU uh, in different ways, with most important one being the hard ECU reset, which technically performs a complete power cycle of the target unit. In our experience, almost 90% of the target ECUs come with no authentication or precondition for hard ECU resets which can lead to several issues uh, described later. What is the outcome of this uh, EV supercar? Uh, as we can see, there are several issues that are connected. Uh, uh, no. Yes, so basically here uh, we have a specific domain of, of ECUs uh, that are directly connected to the, to the gateway and to the head unit. And if we manage to compromise the publicly accessible head unit, we will be able to access directly uh, a BMS, which is a battery management system, an inverter, and the whole batteries that are connected as ECUs to the head unit. In this case, by supplying either an ECU reset to the BMS, which is the battery management system, or a combined um, ECU reset to all the batteries, one, two, or three, or wha whatever uh, is the number of it, we can direct stop uh, the communication between the batteries and the rest of the vehicle and completely stop the vehicle, which was the case uh, as imagined. Of course, there are NDAs. We cannot show exactly what we did with this supercar. And also, when we test these components, we don't test them on the actual vehicle most of the time, sorry, in a running vehicle, but we test it on a con in a controlled environment. But I have another example. Uh, where, where the same POC is, run, uh, is running on a blind spot detection sensor in one of my rentals, uh, which blinks when issuing ECU reset, because you perform a complete power cycle, so the ECU just blinks. And while not critical, not as critical as resetting the batteries, it can potentially confuse the driver uh, that there is something on the blind spot, or even create issues with the adaptive cruise control uh, when relying on the system for turns or, or lane changes. Uh, to conclude, uh, while it was a simple example, we were able to see how bad architectures can, can lead to some devastating results. Automotive architecture understandably gets more complicated due to the need for connectivity, but architecture needs to be revised in a secure way throughout the different iterations and not really <coughs> in old and outdated architectures used in vehicle iterations with half the ECUs. For this, I would suggest more internal buses to be introduced when needed for proper segmentation and safety critical and non-critical components. And better designs should be considered from the first step of production. Uh, when the actual vehicle starts to be implemented and developed, it's already really late uh, to change such significant parts of the architecture. Uh, moving forward, we need to have a talk about design choices. Uh, we already briefly mentioned some of the pitfalls that the industry fell into because of bad design choices uh, in the start, but let me go let me also give you some uh, juicy insights that will hopefully, you will hopefully appreciate. Um, <clears throat> understandably, uh, vehicle development is way more complicated than simply designing and architecting, architecting a vehicle network with several decisions that need to be made uh, under highly constrained uh, budget and time. Uh, one of the issues that need to be resolved is the physical space of the components, the actual space that we will fit everything inside. And where are these components will be placed, how they will fit, are they light enough? Also, weight is a big factor in this. Uh, and other such questions uh, that need to be answered in order to create an efficient and working vehicle which doesn't spend 30 liters per kilometer or uh, has an efficiency of 50 kilometers per charge. At this point, manufacturers need to make sure that everything is secure, as isolated, and inaccessible to external buses. But wha what happens if it's not? Um, in the car theft incident that we saw previously, 
we saw that a vehicle getting stolen due to internal bus buses which were accessible behind the front, uh, the front headlight of the vehicle. Uh, that is a really accessible place, as you can imagine, uh, as an attacker can simply create a small hole behind the wheel of the vehicle to access the bus. And if the architecture is something similar to what we saw in the previous section, potentially unlock the whole vehicle uh, and issue an ignition signal which will start the vehicle and help the attacker start a road trip, which is the case with this finding here from Ian. Uh, during a full vehicle pen test, though, uh, we really often stumble upon some such issues with radars, sliders, and lights being the most vulnerable ones. Uh, as most of the times manufacturers connect these components with internal buses and by combining bad architecture that we saw previously with bad, bad design choices, we can have some really interesting results. Taking as an example our previous diagram, we can see that there are several cameras and radars uh, in one of the buses of the vehicle. Uh, this would not be an issue considering that the bus is isolated from other buses, but because the same domain we uh, on the same domain we have uh, the EBS, the elect electronic braking system, it means that it needs access to the braking and steering ECUs, which that's why we see the inter interconnected bus um, inside the network. Considering that all previous use cases are applicable, uh, we can see the scenario where due to bad design, uh, an attacker managed to get internal bus access through the front radar. Due to bad architecture, he can access the braking system, and by issuing an ECU reset uh, to, the EBS, um, to the EBS system, trigger an emergency braking of the vehicle uh, with potentially devastating results, as you understand. If applied in a highway, for example, we can see something like this. And now let's watch a cute video from a truck manufacturer, uh, which will give us some insights on the current topic and how we will move forward in the talk. So on the near side, we have a battery isolator switch. As with everything with computers on board, before we call action service out, it's always worth just isolating the vehicle, can into 10 and let everything reset itself, re-energize the truck and see if that's corrected your fault. No relation. <laughs> so, completely unrelated on OEM, uh, I just need to emphasize the battery isolator and grab your attention a bit with the video. Um, the battery isolator is included in many EVs, in many fuel cell cars and other heavy duty vehicles. And it's mainly used uh, for isolation uh, of batteries, for safety com concerning incidents, isolator, isolation of inverters, um, and converters, hard reset of ECUs, and clearance of faults. What this isolation does, like the name implies, it separates the direct current into uh, the underlying components. And it actually, um, we actually encountered, the, uh, encountered it several times uh, in our pen test, and mainly in heavy duty vehicles like trucks, buses, uh, some uh, boats, and other. Uh, devices like this that have uh, applicable ECUs. The main question here uh, is if uh, should they be accessible in an unauthenticated manner, as we saw in the video, or if they should be uh, restricted? And to answer this question, we are moving to a next chapter, which is the bootloaders. Um, and we need to talk a bit about it and how some really old vulnerabilities are becoming new again, and we can use them to bypass several restrictions. The, the bootloader usually in uh, electronic control units is architecture specific, um, but it can be accessed through the application layer protocols, uh, which is common alongside all the different architectures that are applicable. The bootloader usually is used for reprogramming per uh, purposes in initialization of application section of the memory, read and write from and to sensitive parts of the memory, and understandably security measures must be taken to restrict unauthenticated access uh, to these bootloaders. Um, the hard truth is, as, is that most of the manufacturers do not restrict access uh, to this part of the memory, uh, which, as you understand, can supply access to some really critical functionality on the underlying systems. Uh, usually, even if we get access to the bootloader, 
uh, some of the sensitive uh, services are restricted to unauthenticated users, and most of the times, uh, these services are the ones responsible for secure update of the unit, as an example, request download and upload, transfer data, and other services are the ones that are usually restricted under some security access implementation. Um, but uh, yeah, most of the ECUs uh, use this bootloader uh, section to perform secure update of the target and authentication subservices for reprogramming is different from the subservices used in application mode and other restricted tasks. In this dia diagram, we see a really simple representation of the application bootloader parts of the system. Uh, the normal boot process uh, starts from the bootloader and then that ends up on the application part, where our implement implemented applications live and manage the tasks which the ECU is programmed to perform. In some of the cases, though, uh, we can use the application layer UDS, uh, protocol uh, UDS, and issue session chains to the programming session, uh, which will technically redirect us to, uh, directly to the bootloader. And usually, uh, this session is unrestricted and we can directly um, uh, supply it and switch to the bootloader. Um, <clears throat> in our experience, this UDS session control programming session is most of the times accessible, as I said, by unauthenticated users. Uh, but what happens if it's not? How do we bypass it? And I don't know if you remember the service ECU reset, but in this case, by supplying an ECU reset, a hard ECU reset, we technically uh, complete, uh, issue a complete power cycle to the unit, and the boot process starts from the start. What we can do now is issue another service, which is a tester present, which does exactly what the service implies, the name implies, which is state that we are there, so we, can, we don't have to supply again and again the same uh, command, the, se the same session chains. So by issuing the issue reset and then issuing a tester present, we can stay to the bootloader mode, even if uh, the switch to programming session is restricted. So what if even the issue reset, uh, reset is restricted? What are we doing now? Basically, uh, on a test bench scenario, where we have the ECU on our test bench and we can directly supply power to it, if we have restrictions on supplying the service ECU reset, we can directly supply power to the unit, which will act as the same thing. We can just use a really simple switch, we can turn off the power, we can resupply it, and then we will have the same boot process. We send again the tester present, we stay in the bootloader, and we have access to all the unauthenticated, um, to all the services that are applicable there, and to everything that opens when we get access to the bootloader. And I don't know if you remember this, but this comes again into the game, uh, because what happens if we have a full vehicle pen test? This is really common, and uh, with the current regulations, we need to have full vehicle pen tests. And e in this case, we don't have the ability to supply power from a power supply, because we don't have the ECU. The vehicle is, cons the vehicle is constructed, it's full, so we need to find another way. And these battery isolators is one of the things that we use to bypass these bootloader res uh, restrictions, the ECU reset restrictions, and the switch to programming session restrictions. So basically, the, uh, the OEM give us an option, give us a switch outside of the vehicle, which we can use to stop the power supply and supply it again in order to get access to the bootloader and bypass all the applicable restrictions in this case. And yeah, here's a summary of what was explained. Let's go through it. We don't have a lot of time. Um, and now switching to something that will lead us to the final and complete compromise of the vehicle. Uh, <laughs> combining our knowledge till now, we need to mention my talk from last year, as we said before, where I evaluated security access seed randomness, which is based in many cases on system clock and how old vulnerabilities, because this is something that we see 20, 30 years now, are becoming new again, and it's really common in the automotive sector. Manufacturers uh, this year, after my previous talk, uh, started realizing and mitigating this issue in most of the components, and sp especially big OEM and tier one suppliers. Did they, though? Uh, 
here you can see that we have the normal boot process and we have one security uh, the security access service in order to give us on the application layer some uh, execution of restricted routines in this case and the subservice is the 03 we find it uh, with uh, enumeration of the unit and in this case while enumerating the unit we find out that the source of randomness it's the hsm there is no way to uh, basically predict the seed that we will receive, so there is no way to bypass it in this case. But performing a bit more of enumeration and uh, applying everything that we saw before by hard resetting the ECU and supplying power to get access to the bootloader by bypassing anything, even uh, the battery isolator, um, in this case, enumerating the bootloader gives us, again, the security access service, but with a different subservice, 01, which is used for reprogramming. And enumerating further, we see that here we have a seed randomness of a system clock. So basically, by enumerating different, um, different sessions of the unit and by applying uh, the different bypasses that we explained in the previous sections, we managed to find a hidden session which basically supplies, uh, supplies us with weak source of randomness and we can eventually bypass uh, and get access to it. Um, <coughs> things uh, which are protected on the application layer can be usually unprotected in the bootloader. Um, many times it's forgotten. I don't know if it's a separate development team that developed the bootloader and separate one that developed the application layer so they didn't communicate or they didn't follow the cybersecurity requirements. Or it's externally resourced, uh, so different co code base. I cannot be sure. Uh, but uh, the outcome is that it's worth testing all the available services and subservices under all available layers on the ECU. And finally, we have the story of the duplicates. Um, what I presented last year and what I extend this year is the seed randomness phaser module for carrying caribou, which is uh, an a, a tool for automating um, uh, security analysis of ECUs. Uh, it's mostly modular with several developed modules and made main advantage of it is the ease of use. Main disadvantage is the inability to easily alter the low level layers of the protocol in this case. Um, as our last use case, let's target the hydrogen ADV, which for safety critical reasons needs to be easily isolated from the batteries. Uh, after enumerating, we find out that ECU reset is not available in any diagnostic session, that the available security access is not backed or, 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 or vulnerable to weak seed randomness, and that no other misconfiguration is discovered during the initial enumeration. And in this case, we go back, we have our favorite battery isolator alongside a really nice uh, relay. And by combining them, we can control when the ECU, when uh, we can stop supplying power and start again by using this externally accessible battery isolator. And what we are looking here is a heavily edited version of the, mod the module that I described, which instead of using ECU resets, it uses complete power cycles from this battery isolator and fixed delays between the power supply and the random seed re request in order to prove that the seed is based on the system clock. And despite having all uh, our preconditions restricted as we discussed, uh, we get fixed seeds and basically as you can see because of the configuration all the seeds received are the same and based on the system clock and it's not a small seed, it's not something that we can actually predict or uh, like manipulate, it's like a really big string that cannot be cracked. In our example, having a relay as the source of uh, the power cycle can result in even more accurate results than by using the ECU reset service that we discussed previously. With around 20% of duplicate seeds of our 1K samples, we can relat be relatively, um, relatively confident uh, that the target is sourcing the ran randomness from the system clock, but even with less, if you see a single 
a duplicate in the, uh, such a big string, I don't think that um, you should think twice. And in most cases, it's easier to intercept the seed and pre-calculated key pair from the bootloader accessible subsession than from the application layer because it's used for reprogramming sessions. So if you send the car um, to the testing center or to the service center and they will reprogram the ECU, it's uh, more applicable that you will able you will be able to intercept this uh, seed in order to uh, reapply the key to the applicable security access subservice. And to conclude, uh, while Karen Caribou might not be the best tool out there, uh, it can help newcomers start, and this is how we also started. Uh, several new automations from my side uh, help the project move forward that you can check online on the uh, GitHub project. Uh, I developed some uh, modules for write data by identifier fuzzer and other really important uh, service. Uh, automated module for complete automation of UDS enumeration, support for new CAN interfaces with proprietary drivers, and different padding or no padding support. And as we reach the end, I would like to briefly mention the differences between what we perform as pen testers and what security research on the automotive uh, industry is. And while reversing firmwares and getting hardware access is fun, scope is usually extremely limited by the client. For this reason, we are tasked to find efficient ways to perform more testing in a result-driven environment. And automation of, task is, of tasks is usually our main priority. With direct result, the extension of uh, our methodology and test cases, and sometimes the investment of our time uh, in automotive research. And for the client side of the things, automotive clients need to understand our methodology and test cases, uh, and we are the ones that need to properly explain it. Abstract res results are not always good, a good way forward, and education is the key for a better collaboration with developers, as there, are no, there is no clear standard and methodology available online, in contrast with mature industries like web, infra, API, and others. And here comes the series finale, and for some food for thought, uh, I have some food for thought for you. I think that... Um, my approach in the industry is a bit more romantic in this case. I care about making the world a safer place. And my way of achieving it is by doing the best to secure vehicles out there and by closely working with manufacturer, manufacturers and by trying to spread the culture like what we're doing here. The thing is that most of them, especially the OG ones, don't really care about this vision uh, and try to undermine issues like the ones we discussed today. Uh, we live in a capitalistic world in the end, and that's what we have to do. We have to build the product, we have to ship it, we have to make it run. So what, the way, uh, what I have to say is that the weight is basically on us, uh, the researchers, the pen testers, the car hackers, and everyone uh, in this field, in this audience, in this camp, uh, to share the culture and make sure issues like this are not undermined by the manufacturers and are not considered ways of modding but things that can directly affect the safety and security of passengers, of drivers, and of people in the streets. That's it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. We have some time for some questions. Are there... Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, I totally get the idea of having a circuit broker for the security services, because they do that when you have your simple car, they just unplug the battery. Yes. Why don't they just put a fucking fuse rather than something that can be reset? It has no real acceptable purpose except what you do. Yeah, look, I, I, unfortunately, I don't work for an automotive. Yeah. Uh, yes, I'm just the supplier uh, and the researcher. I do both things also on my free time. And in this case, I don't have a concrete answer. Uh, usually, it's because 
these vehicles, the heavy duty vehicles, are not directly accessible. It's not a car that you will find on the parking lot in the corner of the street. It's something that is contained in an environment, in a fleet, that you cannot easily access. It's probably secured by some company, so you cannot go there and directly do it. But what if you can? What if you can bypass these, res these physical restrictions? So, yeah, that's, that's the answer. I don't know if I covered you, but yeah. <laughs> Do I see any other? Yeah, over there. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, it was great. Uh, one question, so how do we prevent the car manufacturers using these security measures, which I hope will get better and better every time, uh, to use them to hide secrets in firmware, like we've seen with the uh, emission um, scandals or these days with driving automations? How do we ensure we still get transparency about decisions that are implemented in the firmware while still keeping the car secure against intruders, I guess? Mm, to be honest, I don't know if I have this answer. I think this is a more, more of a political discussion in general in the IT sector, not only in the vehicles, if I'm right. I think that the reason we are here in this camp is exactly this. It's also partially privacy and partially openness and be sure that what we are using is what we are using and manufacturers don't hide anything from us. Uh, in this case, I don't have a concrete answer. What I have to say is that these components are also safety critical components. If something goes wrong with it, people can die. And it's not only about privacy. We also have to think twice when we do something because if we don't develop it properly or if we don't secure it properly, then it's human lives in the stake. So I don't have a concrete answer for the privacy issues because unfortunately it's an issue that we are trying to fix here, but I cannot fix it by myself. Thank you. So, I don't see any other hands. Oh, no, we don't have. We, we have some time. We are quite good on time. Uh, can you? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I have a question about your test cases um, or your free time. Maybe uh, did you get the idea to get a little more creative and maybe uh, use all the sensors of the vehicles to get try to get like yeah artificial inputs that might trigger you see you reset in another way for example get a lighter sensor and shine a bright light on it or any other kind of these kind of things so apart from the requirements that you're testing against um yeah like the test cases that we described here was mainly focused uh, on UDS, which is this application layer protocol. But other than that, there are these messages that are flowing between these CCUs and in the networks that we described. So what you can usually do, and what was really easy to do until a couple of years ago, was that you could easily inject messages inside. So, And as you said, you can basically trick the vehicle on, for example, if you have a LiDAR sensor and the adaptive cruise control is uh, like m focusing all the actions, all the braking actions, the steering actions on this slider sensor, and you manage to inject messages, then you can trick it into doing some action. And that's partially what happened in the video with uh, the blinking light. Um, now there are several technologies that are used, like SecoC, to like handle the two entities and the authentication between the two and which ECU communicates with WITS to avoid these attacks, but it's still not obsolete. You, you, you can still do it. I'm sure that in many vehicles you can still do it and you can inject messages and yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. And okay, so one last question. Uh, just quick question. Did you look into the diagnostic tester from the OEM as an actual attack surface of like the security access algorithms usually having to be there for the workshop to do service. You mean which are the security access al algorithms if so they are secure? So oh. it, you know, the, the diagnostic tester usually has to have the 
algorithm somewhere on the diagnostic tester which mm. makes this an attack surface for the vehicle which is not actually in the side the vehicle but on a computer in a workshop yeah, yeah, yeah like usually these testers are only going to certified um, service points so we cannot obtain them usually we evaluate the security access algorithms which is something that um, it can be weak, it can be not. Some th sometimes it's only you know a byte addition to the key, which is really dumb, and you can reverse it in like a couple of minutes. And sometimes it's AES that you cannot bypass. Uh, but for this, these testers, no, usually they don't come to our hands. It's developed by someone else most of the times, not the OEM uh, specifically, and they just supply the cybersecurity requirements and they develop it. So thank you very much. I have another organizer, like auger <laughs> announcements. Uh, I've been asked to remind you that you should bring back your bottles that you bought to the place where you bought them if they're empty. And you might also want to bring uh, some like uh, bottles that are not belonging to anyone. Just pick them up and bring them back because we have a lot of empty crates that we waiting to be filled to to remain to exchange them with full ones thank you very much the next talk will be here in 15 minutes thanks